for June 19, 2014. The meeting is now called to order. Madam City Manager, would you please call the roll? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Misitich. Present. Councilman Brooks. Here. Councilman Knight. Councilman Campbell. Mayor, Mayor Duhovic. Here. And let the record reflect that uh, Councilman Campbell and Mayor Pro Tem Knight are both excused. Next item, please. Uh, the next item is the flag salute. And I would like to uh, ask uh, Chair Tim Weiner to lead us in the flag salute, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If everyone could please rise, <coughs> face the flag, place your hand over your heart, <coughs> and uh, repeat with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item, please. Uh, the next item is public comments on the special meeting. I have no request to speak on this meeting. Um, so the next item would be the closed session report. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, present at the closed session were yourself, uh, Councilwoman Brooks, and Councilman Misitich. Uh, the council unanimously authorized the filing of a claim with the state of California regarding the 2012 MS4 permit, the vote was 3-0, and the other two council members were not present. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, please. Uh, the next item is adjournment. I'll entertain a motion adjourn. to adjourn. Thank you. Without objection, so moved. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for indulging us there. Uh, we're very excited to have this meeting tonight with the uh, members of the Emergency Preparedness Committee. and. Uh, this meeting was convened at their request, and we are grateful for all their efforts and those of all of our committee and commission members. Uh, very important topic tonight, and I will turn this over to Chair Weiner without further ado. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank the uh, Ranch Pels Verde City Council and my colleagues on the Emergency Preparedness Committee for being here tonight. I'd also like to welcome, uh, we have some guests from other uh, cities here as well. Uh, I'd like to welcome them and thank them for coming. Um, and I'd like to introduce our speaker, you know, in the um, event of an earthquake or other emergency event, maintaining and restoring water service uh, is a priority for all emergency plans, regardless of what the event is. So we're pleased to welcome Mr. Henry Wind, who serves as the district manager of the California Water Service Company, or Cal Water, as you've probably uh, heard it called. Um, Mr. Wind's district serves not only our community, but also Hawthorne, and correct me if I miss any here, uh, Hawthorne, Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, Carson, and parts of Compton, Harbor City, Long Beach, Torrance, and Los Angeles. So, so uh, very important person, and uh, we've invited Mr. Wind to come speak to us today and give a presentation about what Cal Water can do to ensure that we have water uh, following an emergency, and if our water supply is interrupted, what steps Cal Water can take to restore service to us uh, as quickly as possible. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Henry Wind. Thank you very much. Tim, Tim. Yep. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I forgot, to, I forgot to take roll. I approve the agenda. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, um, so do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I all right. I think everybody seconded. Okay. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And uh, for roll call, uh, Tracy, could you take the roll for us? Certainly. Go ahead. Member Boudreau? Here. Member Harder? Present. Member Feinberg? Present. Vice Chair Foster? Present. Chair Weiner? Present. All right. Sorry about that. All right. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Come on. Come on. I think I need a mic uh, so that the cameras can, can pick me up and such. I hope you don't mind if I mill around a little bit. I'm kind of a nervous energy kind of a guy. And um, I'll apologize because I had a really, really cool presentation on PowerPoint, but I crashed my computer when I was trying to hook it up. So I am officially now locked out of our system and there's no way I can get the presentation up. Uh -oh. I made some notes. I'm going to wing it. I think, uh, I think I've got it all, most of it in my head. Uh, so we'll get through the one thing I tell people when I talk uh, is please ask me questions as we go along. Don't worry about holding them until the end. If you've got something on your mind that you want to ask me, something that I mentioned that you wonder about, 
Put your hand up. I'd be happy to try to answer it. Okay? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little easier for that for me that way, and, and hopefully for you all too. Uh, so I'm Henry Lane, the district manager for Cal Waters Rancho Dominguez District. Uh, it's one of the largest districts that our company has. It covers a pretty good, good portion of the South Bay here, um, all of the cities that were mentioned before. Uh, the district was formed in the year 2000 uh, when Calwater merged with the Rancho, with the Dominguez Water Corporation. Uh, you may remember Dominguez from many years ago, so we parsed in the Torrance. Our companies were very similar, we merged. At the time of that merger, we incorporated and, and consolidated uh, two of our existing water districts, the Palos Verdes District and the Hermosa Redondo District with the Dominguez Water Corporation and made, made one very large operation. It's worked out very well for us. It gives us lots of resources and, uh, and a very good employee base. Um, so a little bit about the company. Uh, the company is based in San Jose, California. We are the largest uh, investor-owned water utility west of the Mississippi River far as the statistic goes, so we're very large uh, by water as, as water companies go. Uh, we serve about 450,000 water connections, uh, which totals about 2 million people throughout the state of California. Uh, the company itself has a few other operating subsidiaries, uh, one in Washington, the state of Hawaii, and the state of New Mexico. So that expands our footprint a little bit, a little bit further. But the core of our business is California. Okay? I bring this up because later you'll hear that there's just additional resources available to us being part of a larger company in the event of a disaster. I think it's a pretty important thing to know. Our footprint also stretches from Northern California to Southern California. So in the event of a Southern California catastrophe, Northern California is going to be okay. We can pull from them uh, and vice versa should something happen in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so from, from there, uh, company-wide, we break down into separate operating districts. Again, this is Rancho Dominguez. Uh, the other two nearest districts to us are East Los Angeles, which is located about 30 minutes away. Uh, they would be considered a medium-sized district with roughly 50 employees over there, serving East Los Angeles commerce portions of Montebello and such. Uh, and then a smaller district in Westlake. They're a little bit further away. Going north, Bakersfield, Visalia, uh, Stockton would be very large districts, again, uh, within a couple hour drive. About two and a half hours to Bakersfield or so, assuming that the grapevine's open, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, then Visalia and further north. The system itself that we're talking about tonight, we talked about the Rancho Dominguez district, now we're going to drill it down to the Palos Verdes water system. Okay? It's a standalone system for us, uh, both uh, permitting wise with the Department of Public Health and rate setting wise with the Public Utilities Commission. So being a standalone system, uh, it, it, yeah, well, I, don't, I don't even know what to say on that one. So it stands alone. Sources of water for the system are 100% metropolitan purchased water. That's an important thing to know if you know how water flows down the state. Metropolitan is the company that brings it down through the California Aqueduct, through the Calif Colorado Aqueduct. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, that's part of it. That's part of it, yes. No, you're exactly right. And if you, if you think about the merger that took place, our Palos Verde system was an, a district by itself. Um, it's contiguous with our Hermosa Redondo system, but because of the elevation changes and such, it's isolated, right? It's two separate systems that butt up to one another. There are emergency interconnections, but they are normally closed. So PV is, is its own entity. If, We've got three very large purchase water connections, and then the emergency interconnects with uh, Hermosa Redondo system. Yep. Yes, sir? Is uh, They are a special district, so they, they report to a board of directors. Yeah, um, you know, I, th I think legislation creates special districts. So there was a law that, that came up and probably a, a ballot measure that, that created Metropolitan as the agency to move water down the state. Uh, yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but again, with a board of directors that, that runs and operates it. Yeah. Okay. So, 
Oh, yes, sir. Henry? Yeah. Henry? Henry? I, I'm sorry, one more time. We do not. Not for the Palos Verde system. Uh, basically, the footprint. Yeah, there's, there's no way for us to get water of any reasonable quality through the amount of rock that would have to be, be drilled through to, uh, to make it even close to cost effective. There are some water rights that are attached to the Palos Verde system. Those rights are transferred every year to Hermosa Redondo and then the customer is given a credit for the, the value of those rights. But uh, we do not drill, no. Henry, yeah. Henry, I have a question. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we, since we're not having people come up to the podium, could you repeat the question that's being oh, asked? Oh, yes, so we, yes. Should we have it recorded? Sure, yeah, sure. That would be great. So just okay. repeat what they're asking. And, okay. I Thank you. Throw something at me if I forget to do that. Okay. I'll, I'll try to remember. <laughs> I have a pen. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, water moving up and down the state. Metropolitan, it all starts with Met. Uh, and this is part of my rate speech, too. If something happens with Metropolitan, uh, that gets passed along to you all. So when things happen like uh, uh, environmental issues that Metropolitan is facing and the Delta smelt and they have to turn their pumps off three months out of the year. All of those effects kind of come trickling down to us, both from a supply perspective and a rate setting perspective. Uh, from Met, it goes to uh, an intermediary wholesale agency called West Basin. West Basin is a member agency with Metropolitan. They have the right to purchase water directly from Met. They in turn sell it to us and a number of other cities in the area. Um, as the retail customers. So, uh, knowing that, it's, it's very important to, to, to know that MED is doing their job well for two reasons. They're, they're the big gun in the state, right? They've got the water, they bring it down here to us, they treat it and they bring it down here to us. And secondly, the Palos Freddy system is 100% is purchase water, right? So if Metropolitan is not reliable, we don't have a source of supply. Uh, Matt does a great job. I think you all have heard from Metropolitan in the in the past. Mm -hmm. Did I see that on the, the, the agenda from the last yeah. the last set of minutes? Um, and I will tell you that they are doing a good job as far as reliability goes, uh, and and drought reliability on top of that. Uh, the area is served by three water treatment plants, and you start talking about redundancy. Uh, you know they can take one plant offline. There's two more to back it up. They've got a very good grid of pipes to move that water around. Uh, again, if one plant is taken out of service, they can move water through that grid and still get us water. Um, we've got a few different connections, so should one go out, we can fall back on another one, right? And so redundancy is the key. Uh, so once we get the water, we move it around the system. Another, another key point when it comes to emergency preparedness on our end, there's two, two big things, supply, and then here on the Palos Verdes Hill, power. Right? Power is a big deal, uh, especially for us because we have to take the water from Metropolitan and move it all the way up to the top. 16, 1700 foot elevation change. Uh, we've got banks of, of hundreds of horsepower pumps uh, to move this water in the, in the volume that we need. So essentially, and if I can go over here real quick, I don't know if I uh, brought a couple of props. This is sort of a map of our system and a map of the hill, and you'll see all of the different colors on here. 105 separate colors, representing 105 separate pressure zones. So as you can imagine, it's, it's pretty complicated to get water of sufficient quantity and pressure to each of these zones and to all of the houses that fall within the zones. It's, it's merely an exercise in elevation change. So if you think about pumping water up, as it falls down, it creates additional pressure. We have to break that pressure, and then it may go up another hill. We have to increase it and then drop it down again. It's a really, really fun system to operate for the guys that do it all the time. Um, standard operations are standard operations. When something goes wrong, we have to scramble. Now we have to figure out how to, how to uh, move water around on an interim basis, and that can get, it can get fun, it can get fun. The basics of the water system are we buy water from Matt at the base of the hill and we pump it up halfway. It goes into a tank or two and then it's lifted the rest of the way up to the top of the hill. From those two different lifts, the water just umbrella affects down and falls down back down to the customers. So Henry, are there two major reservoirs then for the hill? There's, a, there's three 
major tank sites and a number of smaller ones kind of scattered throughout. Storage uh, that we have is just over 30 million gallons uh, between all of our, our reservoirs. So to put that in perspective, that sounds like an awful lot of water, um, but, but I try to be as honest as I can with people. Our max day ever, the, the highest amount of sales that we've ever had in this Palos Verde system was 27 million gallons. So you think 30 million gallons of storage, 27 million was our all-time max day, you got one day, right? Now, here's the dose of reality. That's 30 million gallons if every tank was full, right? They cycle up and down all day long, right, at different rates, and they, they're moving all the time. We have to do that for water quality and because of system demand. So in a perfect world, all the tanks are full, all of our pumps were running, when the earthquake hits. Well, I don't know when the earthquake's going to hit, right? I have no idea if it's going to be at midnight or if it's going to be at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, all I know is that it's going to hit. So, supply-wise, we could be looking really good for 24 hours. We could be looking like we've got 6 hours worth of storage. We could be at 12 hours worth of storage. We won't know until it happens. Uh, the, next, the next variable there is which mains are going to break, right? I'm going to have broken water mains. I'm going to have people running around trying to isolate the tanks and to save as much storage as we can and to turn off the main brakes depending on where they're at. So we're going to lose a little bit of storage there. So the moral of the story is, is you've got to be self-sufficient, right? You've got to have some of your own supply to get you through for at least a few days. We're asking people to, to give us a three-day supply. Yeah. And that three-day supply, of course, is just emergency water, uh, a gallon per day per person. Okay, I'm not talking about taking a shower, you know, I'm, this is water just to, just to survive on for a couple of days. The recommendation is one gallon per day per person. Livestock is a little bit different. You've got a lot of, lot of horse owners on the hill. Um, you know, they're going to have to make some provisions for those horses. If they can't get them off of the hill to an area uh, where there is water available, then, then water's going to have to be brought up to them. Uh, and the, the, the horse owners are going to have to do that. What I've suggested to others is there's a lot of water type facilities up there too. Very easy to just have, a trough, have it topped off all the time, you know, so that in the event that their water service is discontinued for a couple of hours, for a day, for maybe two or three days, uh, that there, there's at least a trough there for their horses. As far as homeowners go, um, uh, a three day supply, if you think about it, is pretty attainable. If you've got a hot water heater, there's 50 gallons right there. Just make sure that the valve on the bottom of the hot water heater works, right? You have to be able to access it. So there's, there's fresh, clean water in everybody's hot water heater. I've got a 50-gallon hot water heater at home. Um, a lot of people ask me, listen, I, I just put in one of these great tankless hot water heaters, right? Well, then you don't have that option. <laughs> I don't know how, how, to, how to work around that. But, uh, so hot water heater's good. Um, what else can homeowners do? I, I talk about valves quite a bit. Let me get another demonstration thing here. Everybody should have a valve on their front faucet. Now if I can hold this up. Basically, what we've got is a water meter that's in the ground. You've got a line that runs up to your front faucet, right? usually all the way across your yard. It comes up the front of your house and there's a valve and you've got your front faucet. By code, this valve is, is required. I ask people to make sure that that valve works because usually it's been 10 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years since anybody's turned that valve. You don't want it to break when you need it. I ask people to make sure that the valving at their hot water heater works. I ask people to make sure that the valves on their toilets work, the little shutoff valve. If you have... Uh, in the event of an earthquake and your toilet falls over and cracks and you've got a leak on just that one little line that feeds your toilet, you turn that valve off and the rest of your house still has water, right? If that valve doesn't work, guess what? You've got to come back over here and turn that valve off and now your whole house is without water. The water stops coming from the meter at that valve, okay? Next little trick. If a person really wants to be prepared, I tell them to put a valve up above their, their faucet. Put it behind the faucet and in line with the house. So that in the event you have 
the hot water heater falls off, uh, your, your sink uh, is ruptured, you can't turn something off over there, you can come over here and turn off the valve that feeds your house. If the valve is past this spigot, you've still got water at the spigot, water coming from the meter. So you always want a point of access for water. In this case, it turns off the whole house and that faucet. The simple installation of another valve would give a person at least access to water at that front faucet. Okay? The next thing people can do, and I brought one of these, these nifty little gadgets with me, is hook, hook one house up to another house. Our guys carry these things. It's called the hose-to-hose -hose connection. You can buy them at Orchard Supply. You can buy them at any quality hardware store. Um, down, I think it's on Western Avenue, there's a, a hydraulic hose supply place, the, the hose man, I think he's called. Um, all it is is a double female fitting that hooks up to uh, the garden hose. So, if my house is, is um, still has water, because I've got all of my valves in place and I've, I kept everything in good condition, my neighbors does not, I can turn off this house valve now, below the faucet, put this fitting on here, open up the faucet and just simply run a garden hose from my front faucet over to, to my neighbor's house. And it will feed water over to my neighbor, right? Very simple thing, it's a, it's a $5 fitting. Anybody can buy one, anybody can use one. Just gotta make sure your garden hose doesn't have too many leaks in it. Yes? Does that faucet represent the water going into the house? Yes, yes. So basically the front faucet, you know, usually where your line comes up, there's generally a faucet right there. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, yes. Typically, this would, this would come up and, and shoot into your, into your house. Yeah, yeah, I think those, uh, the new ball valves are better than the gate valves. That's right. They are, they are. I've got two of these, I brought one of them with me. One of them's got a ball valve on it. <laughs> I, grabbed the, I grabbed the wrong one. But yeah, you're right, the ball valves are great. They're nice positive shut off, they're easy to operate, they work for much longer than, than these old gate valves. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. We, we run into that a lot. So then the only option for a homeowner is to come all the way out to the meter and turn off the water company valve, right? So there's another little tip. Make sure that that valve works. Um, many water companies will say, don't touch that. That belongs to me. I'm a little bit different. I don't mind if you touch that valve because in the event, and make sure that it works and that you have a tool to turn the thing on and off. In the event of a real disaster, I mean the big one, right, I'm not going to have enough people to go turn off 10,000 water meters in a timely fashion. I would rather have you all be able to do that, um, or at least 50% of the turnoffs be accomplished by someone other than the water company, uh, just to help us save water store, you know, save our stored water. Every leak that there is, is, is a gallon of water that could be saved, right? So, um, if you've got a tool, get in your meter box, operate the valve. If it's stuck, call us. We'll come and replace it. We'll break it free. We'll make sure that it works for you. Yeah. Yes, sir? So far we've been talking about disasters and earthquake events. What happens to Alice Burns when, for instance, uh, one of the canyons burns? Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. What, you know, what's the impact on the, the overall system? Right. Okay, Henry, that's a great question. Henry, Henry that's a, can you repeat? Oh, that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. The question, the question is, in the event of a large fire that takes off of a, up a canyon, uh, what what is the impact to the water system? Right. Did I did I capture that that well? A um, couple of things. Back to the fire. We were there. Uh, people don't see the water company there. Everybody sees the fire trucks with the lights and the, you know, the command center and all of that, but we were there. Uh, we set up an emergency operations center in Torrance, which is our nearest large office. We had an EOC going on our Crest, Load, Crest Road satellite facility where we can also control our pumps. Two locations to control the pumps. We had people in both. Matter of fact, Dan Trejo, the assistant district manager and I were, were at one each. Uh, we had a superintendent in the fire command center, making sure that the fire department had enough water and that they were hooking up to the right hydrants so that they could get the water that they needed. Um, so number one, what happens? 
is we try to prevent damage by supporting the fire department, make sure that that fire gets put out, right, quickly. Um, and that we had enough water for the, the next day when our customers all got up and started trying to take showers, right? Um, it, it's a good thing when people don't know that we're there. That means we didn't have a problem. The rest, uh, we've got stations scattered throughout, throughout the hill. If one of those stations burns, then we have to adjust our operations to live without that station, right? And that can be done uh, in some cases pretty simply. If it's a small location that's just feeding one small pressure zone, open up some valves, make some adjustment to the, uh, to the clay valves, the hydraulic valves, and, uh, and divert water around another way, get it fixed, right? Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very reactionary thing at that point. We just have to analyze the, the incident, react to it as best as we can, um, and go from there, right? Very reactionary. Yeah. Good question. Very good question. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir? On that note, since the system is gravity fed, and the fires are more likely running uphill. What is the pressure at the hydrant on the top hydrants of the hill? Their the minimum is about 40 PSI. Okay. So are, are each of these pressure zones, there's a range. There's, there's a legal range and, and there's a desired range, right? We have to average 30 PSI throughout the course of the year at any specific location. Our system is designed so that at the highest point, of any one of these zones, it's 40. As the water falls down the zone, it'll increase all the way to 120, and then we break the pressure, which is 120 is the legal limit, um, and then we break the pressure and start it all over again, start at 40 and let it fall down further. And yeah. during the, the case of a fire as you had, when so many apparatus, fire apparatus were pulling from the hydrants, right. that's the case where you guys boost the pressure to maintain a minimum, or would you try to get 100 oh. pounds? Okay, in, in a fire event, uh, the requirement is 20 PSI, okay? As, as trucks are actually sucking water out of our system and basically a fire truck is one big booster pump, right? So uh, they're drawing water out, we should maintain 20 PSI. They try to only draw enough water out to allow us to maintain 20 PSI for a couple of reasons. We don't want them to damage the main. They don't want to damage the main. If they draw too hard, too many trucks on one line, pulling too hard, it can actually collapse the main like a tin can, okay? Another reason that it's very important that we are at the command center, that we're out, you know, at, at these, uh, the, the, the truck locations as well. Fire departments are very aware of that. They're, they're good. They're, they're really good. Um, as far as pressure goes, yes. They always ask for more pressure, right? Well, I want more water. I, I want to hook up another truck. That's where our pump operators come in again, and perhaps we make some adjustments to the valves divert water into that particular pressure zone, perhaps we will say, hey, listen, the zone boundary is right here. Hook up two of your trucks here, go across the street. Sometimes it's, it's simply right across the street, if you know what you're looking at, right? And hook two trucks up over there. We're golden, we're golden. It's fun, I, I, it's a crisis, but, but that's where the real operators, kind of the, the cream rises to the top in, in an emergency event, yeah. And our people are good, they're really good at it. Really good. Thank you. That was a great question, too. Henry, you talked a little bit about if, um, if a fixed asset got damaged, like a pumping station or something of yours that got damaged. Do, do you all have the capability of bringing in things on trucks or do you attend, put them in on a temporary basis, or do you actually have to repair the fixed asset that got damaged? Another great question. And that one was in the mic, so that's good. Right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Um, the stations that we can live without for a period of time and divert water around, um, they're just there. We would, we would repair those as quickly as we could. Um, and basically it's a drop everything and spend whatever it takes and get that new pump in. Um, sometimes we're at the mercy of, of Southern California Edison. Listen, your transformer burned down, we're repairing our station, let's work together and get me some power and I'm gonna fix my pump. And, and they're great, they're, they understand. Um, we have other locations that are set up for portable power. So basically, matter of fact, last year we got done rebuilding one. Um, new panel board, basically a very large pigtail type setup, so we back up, and in this case, very large station. It's a generator the size of a diesel truck, right? Back it up, wire it in, fire the pumps up. That can all be accomplished within 
a matter of hours, right? So that, that's the idea there. Um, in our next rate case, next year we'll, be, we'll file again for a new set of capital projects, a new set of maintenance money. Uh, we've included two stationary generators at a couple of more key stations mm -hmm. where we don't want to wait for the truck and the rental and all of that. We want a fixed generator there with a transfer switch. Power goes out, generator fires up, it's seamless. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yes, sir, question. Okay, question is, in the event of a large earthquake, trucks may not be able to get through, rental yard may be swamped, right? Are we first in line, are we last in line? Exactly, that, that's a good one too. Um, and I guess my response is, you're absolutely correct. The, the roads may be out. It may be difficult for us to get a truck up here. Um, uh, the rental yards, we have agreements with them and, and you know, we say, okay, you're first in line and you're gonna get this one and we're gonna have a driver and it's gonna be all fueled up and there's some risk, right? Uh, in a perfect world, it's gonna work great. In, a, in the world that we live in, there's probably gonna be some difficulties, uh, which is exactly why we are gonna go to the fixed generators a couple at a time. Uh, in 2015, we'll file for two and we plan on expanding that in the future. A couple of challenges, uh, one is space because of the size of these things and the, the size of the pumps that they need to run. Secondly, um, we're going to have a big hurdle getting air quality permits for these things. Quite frankly, I mean, it's going to be tough. So you may see me come back asking for support from committees and city councils to, to push those types of things through. Yes, ma'am. Where will the first of these stationary generators be located? You're gonna, that's a tough, station 22 and station 30, I don't know exactly where they're at. Uh, well, for example, um, <laughs> yeah. the intermediate pumping station you have near Mira Lest Intermediate School, that's the first pump, uh, intermediate place from mm -hmm. the Palos Verdes Reservoir up to the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. Does that have any stationary generator right now? Right now, no. Okay. Um, is that where a portable generator could go? Is, would a portable generator have enough power to push the water the rest of the distance up to the top? Could go. Uh, it could go, yes. So this is another sort of phase of what we're doing. Um, we, we do own emergency generation equipment ourselves. Mm -hmm. The catch is, is it's just not large enough to run an entire bank of pumps. So the short answer is yes, it can run some pumps. Yes, we can hook it in. We would do that. Um, the little bit longer answer is we have also budgeted for more retrofits to make it a quicker hookup, to have a parking pad there so that we can just back it in and, and you know, not have to do anything custom. Um, and we've budgeted for two additional portables. Again, they're gonna be small, it's gonna be a limited supply, but at least it's some water moving from one zone to the next. Um, it may not make it all the way up to the top. Another thing that the company... Henry, can I ask you a question on the yes, generators? Yeah. What is the endurance of the generator? How long will it run without being refueled? Yeah, it depends on the generator and the load. Um, right. Uh, our portables, the last time we used one, uh, at a medium load, I want to say it was about six to eight hours before we got to refuel it. We were going to refuel it up. some storage as well. Now, they're going to run into the same boat as the question that was asked earlier. They're going to be built in a lot of different direction. So, we'll do the best we can. Uh, and we'll try to station these things wisely uh, to provide as many people with water as reasonably possible. Henry, you had talked a little bit earlier about, during your opening comments about some of the mutual aid agreements you have with other districts or other parts of the state. Could we uh, talk a little bit about that perhaps? All right. Yeah. Well, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
He's prepared. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm on. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, let, let me touch it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, let me put the mic through. Great, thank you, thank you. That's good, awesome. Okay, so question, uh, mutual aid within Cal Water, other yeah. Cal Water districts. So, what, what I have got immediately available to me here with my existing staff that, that Dan and I, uh, that, that report to Dan and I, uh, we've got 100 people here in the South Bay, okay? Uh, when we're talking about the big one, right, those 100 people are going to be scattered through four separate operating systems. Um, uh, from there, uh, I will just assume for, for discussion purposes that East Los Angeles is in the same boat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then we would look to our Northern California systems, to the systems that are, are not affected by the disaster or by the emergency. Uh, we would call upon them to send people here. Uh, I guess the best example would be uh, the, the Northridge earthquake some time ago. Uh, I happened to be working in East Los Angeles at the time and we were sending crews over to Northridge to go assist and support. Um, both manpower, trucks, uh, fuel, equipment, uh, uh, materials, right? And we, we brought it all. So I, Cal Water would do the same thing. And, and we've got about a thousand employees company-wide. Not all of them are field, you know, some of course are general office and support and the accountants and the engineers and all of that. Uh, but I would say 800 or so employees company-wide that, that know how to turn a wrench, that know how to fix a water main that, that could respond in the event of an emergency and we needed that help. So we would call upon them. Um, the company emergency response plan calls for us here locally to open up our EOC. Again, we've got two locations, one here on the hill, one in Torrance that are set up, video communication, all of that. Hopefully video works and the internet works. Um, uh, our general office in San Jose would open up their EOC which uh, essentially would be staffed by our engineering department, corporate, finance, you know, all of the things that that, that SEMS model requires. Do, do you know if your emergency operations centers have the ability to interface with either the city or the Los Angeles County EOCs? We don't have a formal agreement with them, but it would have the ability to, yes. Uh, you know, between phones and, and internet and, and not internet, uh, video conferencing and such. It's a web-based internet system, I mean, web-based video system. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyone could tie into that and we'd just provide those numbers. Um, we've had some real improvements here over the last, I'm going to say six months, uh, with our the formalizing agreements like that. As a matter of fact, today uh, in our district, we, we went through some SEMS training. Our company has hired uh, the former fire chief from the city of Oakland. So if you can imagine, this guy knows his stuff. Uh, and he put on a four hour class for us today for all of my supervisors. That's one of the things that he talked about, that we need to do that. We need to be prepared to send people to the other EOCs and be able to ask for, for additional support if, if that's needed. So you'll probably see that, that coming around here soon. Yeah. Yes, sir. How many uh, either portable or fixed generators would be required for 100% redundancy? What's the number we're talking about? Is it three? Is it 10? What is it? Um, the big ones, uh, there we've got a 100% is, is next to impossible for us to do because of space. We just don't have the room to install these things. Uh, we've got some stations that would take four semi-trucks back to back to back in order to run all of the pumps at that particular station. So we, we just simply don't have the space to do that. Uh, what, we would, what our goal is is to get at least 50% of our pumps running. So we'll have half, you know, the ability for half so of our pumps So at the 50% mark, how many... Just again, oh, any gosh. rough idea? Um, I'm trying to get understand the oh, scale. Oh yeah, here. yeah. I mean, I'm. This is 
This is a real, real rough estimate, probably 20 or $30 million, and just in dollars and cents. Uh, three very large installations and about five or six uh, much smaller ones, just to keep water moving around. The, the three big ones are, are the big money. So three big ones and six or seven smaller ones. And six or seven smaller ones. And yeah. 20 to $30 million. Uh, real, real rough yeah, ballpark, okay. yeah. No, I appreciate that, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how many customers would the cost of that 20 to 30 million be allocated to? Good question. Uh, there's 24,000 service connections in the Palos Verde system. So we've got 24,000 customers, 26,000 if you include all the fire protections and things like that. So back to this being a standalone system as far as the Department of Public Health is concerned and the California Public Utilities Commission for rate making. Any money that I spend in this system for generators, for maintenance expense, for employees, whatever, it, that cost is borne by the Palos Verdes customers. So yes, it, it would be... It would be About uh, $1,000 a customer? Yeah, over time, over time. Um, uh, we're a, uh, an investor-owned public utility, so our shareholders would invest that money, and then over time the customers pay that back, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's depreciated until it's gone, and then we have to reinvest and all. So, yeah, money. It's a lot of money. The problem is when you add the interest on any debt plus any capital recovery charges, you might be looking at maybe 1500 to 2000 per customer. I'm sure it would add up, and the bigger users would have to bear a little bit more of that cost, of course, because of the volume that they use. And um, The water rates are already pretty high here. Uh, and the main driver there is, is it's all purchased water, which is expensive for us. And secondly, the cost of power to move the water all the way up the hill. None of my other systems have that cost. So electricity is a big one for me too. Now, what is the difference in cost per unit for water delivered here on the peninsula versus say in Torrance down in the basin? To be, uh, uh, accounting for the power requirements. Right. Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm going to say between 50 cents and a dollar per 100 cubic feet. So for each 750 gallons, you're paying 50 cents to a dollar more than someone would in the city of Carson. Okay. Mm -hmm. Henry, a couple, yes, couple more questions, if I may. Um, are these hard borders, do they follow the city's borders, or is it, is it not, you know, because the pipes there were part of the east side of the hill, was part of the city of LA before, was there D marks are there are there hard cutoffs here? Is there a little bit of overlap? Yeah, um, as far as the edges of the system go, they're hard borders. They are. Yes, there's a st distinct separation between um, our system and our neighboring systems. Okay. There is some overlap into say the city of Lamita. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, Lamita. we serve a few blocks in the city of Lamita, and mm -hmm. just the way the growth and expansion occurred that long ago, that uh, it was best for Cal Water to serve that. What about reciprocal arrangements with the city of LA since yeah. you know, San Pedro kind of rolls up the peninsula proper as it were? Right. Um, no, we don't have uh, a reciprocal arrangement with them, a formal arrangement. There, there's always mutual aid, of course, that, that is just understood. Mm -hmm. um, neighboring systems, I'm, I'm going to just make the same assumption that if the earthquake or the event was that great, they're going to have their own issues to deal with, right? So I, I always feel very fortunate that we're part of a large company with a, a very diverse footprint. I've, I've got lots of people available to me um, that the other cities don't, quite frankly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What about, um, this is just an observation, the reservoir, TV Drive North and Palos Verdes Drive East. When I was young, that thing was filled almost to the brim and now it's way way down is that just for and i understand there's a cover and all this stuff but just the volume is just a fraction of what it used to be right back in the good old days oh no you're absolutely right that that is got to be the largest uh potable water reservoir that i have ever seen mm -hmm. and what is it then 250 million gallons there's just some some unreal number in it and it's treated potable water met uses that as a buffer of storage We've got a pump station that pulls directly out of that reservoir when there's water in it. That's, that's a big thing. Um, as I understand it, Matt, Matt is working on the fix. It's been empty for quite some time, about six years now, seven years maybe? 
So are you right. saying it's empty right now? Yeah, the, they, yes, the cover was bad, so they, they just basically drained it. What we are doing now is we're bypassing that. So we've got the ability to pull out of it when there's water. Uh, when there's not, we, we draw water directly from Metropolitan's Trenton, their, their main line. So that's not part of your system, that's it, Metropolitan's asset. Correct, it's Metropolitan's, but we are looking forward to them placing that back in service. And so I understand that that should be happening within the next year or two. Okay. That's the last what, I heard. One final question, if I may. The, um, there are storage tanks in the preserve. What, what, can you give us an indication of how, uh, is, am I stating that correctly? The tanks that are up there, those are in use storage facilities, is that correct? Okay. Yeah. In the nature preserve and okay. the 1,400 acres? Okay. Okay. So, well, I guess the question is, how does that play in at all? Is that, does it make a difference? It's in the preserve. Are there any prohibitions that you're aware of with respect to dealing with that because it's in the preserve or anything like that? No, no. Okay. Um, you know, we, we, uh, you have the necessary easements and things. Oh yeah. 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 All, all of, you know, the, the water system dates back so far, you know, Cal water purchased the water system from Palos Verdes water company, which dates back to the, the inception of, of the hill, right? So we acquired all of the, the rights and the easements and, and all of that. Um, uh, and, and there's lots of intricacies to every facility we have, right? Whether it's a local city ordinance, uh, uh, maybe it's in the preserve, uh, maybe it's a, a historical site. We've got a couple of buildings that are considered historical, so we can't touch them. Um, just something that we deal with, and, and it's fine. It, it works out fine. Yeah. Yeah, to the gentleman's point about the preserve and fires, that you know you have a water asset right there. I'm not sure if it's piped or plumbed to turn that over to the uh, fire department for use in that area. It's a fairly decent sized storage. At least it's something. Yeah. Know, up on, so. uh, I, I don't know about that particular site, but yes, we do have facilities like that, uh, where probably about 10 or 15 years ago, we we took uh, tank access points, hatches and such and put a, a fitting on there so that the, it was the right size that a, the fire department pump truck could actually draw right out of that reservoir Great. In, a fi in a fire event like that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir, in the back. I'm, I'm sorry, would you repeat that one more time? Okay, uh, question. We've got a tank that we're looking at constructing in Rolling Hills. Um, uh, and the, how would that help with uh, water storage, uh, wildfire protection, right? Yes, okay. Uh, I guess the simple answer is any additional storage that I can get is a good thing, right? Uh, so that in the event of a fire, it, it, the system floats off of the storage. We can only pump so much up the hill at any given time, even if we've got all the power that we need, right? There's water coming into the system. We draw from our storage at the same time, and between those two sources, there's enough to put out the fire, depending on the length of the fire event. So additional storage is, is always a good thing. In that particular case, uh, the tank is situated and located at an elevation of that first lift. So that would provide us a redundancy. Once we go through the first lift, now there's a second storage spot that we can lift up further. So it gives us redundancy, it gives us additional storage. Uh, it would include an additional uh, pump station to move water up the hill. So the answer is yes, it, it would help us uh, greatly. Great. Yes, sir, in the back. Right. Okay. Question. In the event of a, a huge disaster, are there automatic valves that will shut off to save storage in the tanks and in the mains? Um, and the answer to that is no. Uh, we do not have automatic valves. We have got hydraulic valves to maintain pressure uh, throughout that can be adjusted with a turn of a knob to stop flow, to either increase or, or locate or reduce flow and hence pressure. Uh, but we do not have automatic valves. What we do have is a SCADA computer system, uh, uh, what is it, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, SCADA. Uh, and basically it's a remote system. 
as to where we can operate our pumps and increase, decrease uh, pressures and flows remotely at all of our tank sites and at the key booster pumps. So while we can't push a button and just shut valves, we can turn pumps on and off and we can monitor from, from a remote location. Dispatch crews. Yeah. In the front, yes sir. Another, another good question. Um, uh, supply to the north side of the hill, uh, very reliant on one pipeline. Is, is there a plan to, to add some redundancy and add another pipe? And the answer is yes, we are still working on that plan. Uh, a number of years ago, the original design, uh, uh, Crenshaw Avenue, very heavily trafficked streets, basically got shut down, right? You are not going to screw up Crenshaw and come right up here with a pipeline and, and mess up traffic for everybody coming and going. So our engineering team and the consultant that we've hired uh, has gone back to the drawing board and they're reworking it to try to stay away from some of those heavily trafficked streets, perhaps use some poor horse trails, uh, things like that. The tank site that was mentioned earlier is all part of that plan. So an additional pipeline for some redundancy. Uh, it would also eliminate uh, some other line, 20 inch main, that runs through an inaccessible canyon, quite frankly, going to be very difficult for us to repair. It also runs pretty darn close to some homes, so there's a liability issue there too. Uh, so yes, it's still in the works. Uh, they're probably at about 85 percent design right now. We're moving forward with the tank site as a key component. Uh, and in 2015, the Public Utilities Commission is going to hear about this project. We will ask them if they want us to include the funding for it in our standard rate case filings, which is every three years, or whether they want us to file a completely separate rate case and hold separate public hearings and things like that. So um, at the end of next year, we should have a little better idea of, of where we're going to go with it, what it's going to cost, and is it going to work? Right. Yes, ma'am. What is the status of a plan you had for a one million gallon reservoir across from the post office uh, in Rolling Hills Estates off of Silver Spur Road? Mm -hmm. There was a plan in that little park area there? <clears throat> Correct, and that's the same reservoir that we were talking oh. about earlier. Uh, the plan has shifted away from the park area. Uh, constructability cost, uh, it's an existing park, all of that. Uh, we started looking elsewhere, and, and we're actually looking in the area across, across the street now, working with a property owner there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir? Sea level? No, really, and I'm not trying to be funny, but it will flow down to, to sea level. Um, uh, basically, the I'm just going to say the flats at the, at the base of the hill, right, that that would, would essentially be the, the elevation that it would stop at, assuming that Metropolitan's lines were, were holding the water back and that they weren't leaking. Yeah. So it'll seek the lowest point, and it, it's actually a good, a good point. Uh, if you think about storage being situated throughout the hill, the way the system works, bringing water up in two separate lifts with, with very large storage in three different places. Um, the, those folks that live on the, at the highest elevations are going to be without water first, right? The water is going to be cascading down. Those that live at the lowest elevations will have water for a little bit longer period as, as the, mains, the mains themselves carry a huge amount of storage too. Um, so Henry. be more prepared. Yes, sir? Yeah, I um, had the opportunity to see a presentation emergency preparedness presentation done by the LA County Sheriff's Department last year. Mm -hmm. I think Councilwoman Brooks was with me at the California Contract Cities um, uh, in, in, uh, down in the desert, and they had a simulation of a earthquake based on the Southern San Andreas Fault, basically based uh, originating in uh, the Salton Sea, mm -hmm. and with all the computer graphics and seismologists, they were able to show how that would 
roll through the soil and hit Los Angeles 20 seconds after the fault slipped. Yes. And it was a um, presentation that basically described a extinct extinction level event. It was tremendous damage to downtown LA and the whole LA basin um, when that occurred. And the sheriff's department said, look, you may be on your own for 10 to 14 days. Now we've talked about having water supply for three days. That's uh, 14 days, can those extra you know, uh, nine days or 10 days can be a long time in a lot of people's lives. Right. And so what you're saying is if the whole basin was without power. There was a major grid damage and um, you weren't able to get diesel to your generators. We're on a hill, basically the peninsula is a hill. We can't get water up above sea level. Um, you may have some water in your storage tanks, in, uh, but nowhere, no ability to pump it out. Right. Uh, does it make any sense for some type of um, logistics system like we were talking before, trucks? But I'm not talking about trucks that where you go after the event happens and you go to a rental place and go rent them. Mm -hmm. I'm talking trucks that are pre-positioned uh, pre right near the storage and it, just for that type of situation. Right. Uh, I'm talking old uh, construction trucks that uh, construction companies may sell for a, you know, a little bit of money that are just used just for that purpose in case that does happen one day. Positioned near the storage areas that can bring water to predetermined distribution areas throughout the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Like, you, they said roads may be damaged. Correct. You may have to go to certain three or four different points in the peninsula and people may have to bring buckets to those trucks because they can't, there, there's just no way to get through because of damaged roads and that kind of thing. But there's still an ability to distribute water. Would a, a, a plan like that make sense in that kind of scenario? Um. I, I get asked that question actually frequently, you know, do you have the ability, do you plan on having the ability, it, it, and, and my answer is no, that that's not part of our current plan uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, one, you have to have water to put in those trucks, so I would generally be parking a truck next to, next to a reservoir, right? Or a tank. Or a tank, mm -hmm. right. So if there is water in that tank to take it out and put it in a truck and then move it over a, a few miles uh, to a, a pre-designated site, what my plan would be is to take that water in that reservoir and make that reservoir the site. Does that make sense? So if I've got a million gallons in storage, it's there, we've isolated it, that's where I would distribute the water from and, and ask people to come to me okay. uh, rather than okay. trying to maintain all of that, right? Yeah. Great question. I, I get that one a lot as well. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The uh, city of Los Angeles has had a lot of major water main breaks in the last several years. Uh, how would you assess the condition of your mains here? And what concerns me, uh, being on this committee, is if there was a main running along the crest of the peninsula and that main broke, and we know you don't have automated valves that will shut off the flow of water, and you could have you know, quite a bit of earth that gets moved as a result of this underground main break. So how would you assess the condition of your mains? Our mains are actually in quite good shape. Um, uh, a couple of statistics to look at when I, when I look at a water system. One is a lost water percentage. We know how much water comes into our system. We know how much goes out through the meters and, and we sell. Uh, standard in the industry is anything less than 10 percent, you're doing pretty good. Our system is less than five. And that 5% includes fire department using water, us running fire flows for new development when we're testing our fire hydrants, um, water theft, quite frankly, somebody coming up with their water truck and using it on their construction site. So, so the actual water loss through, our, through leakage is even smaller than that 5%. So there's one mark of a, of a system that's in pretty good shape. Uh, secondly, uh, um, oh gosh, I'm losing, oh. The number of main leaks per year, right? How many leaks per mile of main? And it's, oh God, what's the statistic? Uh, I think we have one or two leaks per, per, let me think here. 
Got about 350 miles of water main, uh, roughly 30 leaks per year, so one leak for every 10 miles of water main per year. Not too bad, right? That, that's, it's much better than some of our other Cal water systems. Now, the one thing that does concern me on the hill is just the hill is moving, right? It, this, this whole hill moves. Mm -hmm. So that puts strain on the mains. So it's not really age or condition that concerns me. I'm looking at two things. The size of the main, it's an old system. Uh, many of the mains are four inch. Uh, some of them are even two inch water mains. Don't carry a lot of water as far as fire flow goes, right? I'll, I'll hold, that, hold that thought. <laughs> um, uh, secondly, with the ground movement, right? It just puts, it's, it's a, a bearing break. Mm -hmm. So what we did last rate case uh, is we pushed really hard, we being Cal Water, uh, with the Public Utilities Commission, and we made an argument stating both of those things. Listen, we need to improve fire flow. This, the, the nature of the area has changed a lot in the last 60 or 70 years. It's underserved in some areas. We want to upsize the mains. We want to put in new mains. Uh, plastic main, uh, ductile iron main is what we're using now. And if you just think about ground movement, it's in a brand new trench. So the trench is this wide, the main sits in the middle, it's encased in sand. The ground can move an awful lot uh, before there's a, a significant amount of pressure put on that main. So those two arguments allowed us to, to really increase the footage of our main replacement. We're at about 6,000 feet per year now. Uh, we're looking to increase that again in 2015 and, and bring it up some. Again, focusing on the, the two areas that I, I mentioned before, fire flow and, and age. Yes, sir? Okay, question, when did the last time we, um, we did a water audit uh, looking at, if I can paraphrase, non-essential uses versus, versus essential uses, right? Um, I don't know that I have a statistic like that. Uh, I don't know that we've, we've analyzed it that far. We, it would, it would, and, and part of our, oh, sorry, the, um, would that not increase the day's storage that was available in the event of an emergency? And, and yes, you're absolutely right. So one of our first uh, actions in the event of an outage where we were trying to conserve what storage we had, we would be going public and asking people not to irrigate. Golf courses and non-essential uses like that would, would need to stop. If they did not, we would go to our high value targets, the ones that we know about with that large four inch meter, we would turn it off. You don't get water. Right until we get through this crisis. Um, we would try to control hoarding. That's going to happen. People are going to say, listen, I'm filling up my bathtub. Right? There's, there's 20 gallons for me. We're going to try to control that. Um, I don't know quite how, but we're going to ask people. Um, we would be on the radio. We would be on the TV. And we would be using our emergency notification system, which is basically a computer-operated phone system where we can call. We'll, we'll be calling you at home. Right? We'll be sending text messages, we'll be sending emails to those who have given us that information.